Hey, plant peeps, what's up? Welcome back to another video from Here But Not. Today, uh, I'm not gonna talk about orchids at all. Uh, it's gonna be completely about aeroids. Uh, I have some pretty cool ones that I got almost a year ago. I think it was last May. And uh, they've gotten a lot bigger. So in light of that, I wanted to show off kind of how, how they've done and, and how I've managed to get them to grow so large. I know that some people who grow some of these larger aeroids like Philodendron Melanochrysum and uh, Philodendron El Choco Red, as well as the Anthurium Salagrens, uh, have troubles getting them to produce larger leaves. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I do to, to get these plants to grow well. Uh, but first, why don't I introduce you to the plants that I have and uh, that'll give you an idea of, of, of kind of what's what in my collection. I don't have too many aeroids. I've got, uh, I think, 12 or 13. I did kill an Anthurium crystallinum over the winter. It dropped leaves, and I thought that I could keep watering it following a wet-dry cycle, and what ended up happening is the main base rotted out. So uh, still a noob, still learning, but uh, let's get on with, with introductions. All right, so at the top of the list, we'll knock off the vining monsteras. This is Monstera acuminata, Guatemala, Guatemala, which I believe is the area that it's located or, or was collected. Uh, if you look at the internodal lengths on this compared to Monstera adansonii, they're substantially larger, larger. The leaf texture is also a lot thinner or more, and more like velvety, whereas Monstera adansonii has a thicker leaf texture overall, like it feels different and the internodal gaps are much closer. They, they tend to stretch out in high light, or sorry, in low light, but in high light you get really close um, growth. Whereas on the Acuminata, they, they stay like quite long all the way through. So that's why two plants that I got around the same time, uh, one has filled an entire post while the other one is still just like ground and well, like growing along the ground and creeping. Uh, a recent acquisition is Monstera epipremdoides, which is undergoing reclassification right now. So I recognize that that's not the true name. It's some other species that is yet to be named. However, uh, I really love this species. They get big leaves that are that have that fenestration or holes in them. Um, and it's kind of the reason that I got both of these. I had originally got this one expecting it to be Adansonia, and then I got Adansonia, thinking that it would become big and produce larger leaves as it matured. And then the more research that I did, I kind of was like, well, no, this is, this is the plant that I want to get the look that I want. So I may end up in the future getting rid of the Adansonia and the other one, but for now, they're part of the collection, whatever. Uh, I also have a Monstera deliciosa variegata, whatever that like variant is with the white stripes, but it's reverting to green. And I think that has to do with the fertilizer that I'm giving it. Uh, the one that I took to work that doesn't get the same fertilizer has started to bring back the white. Next up, I'll do the philodendrons or introduce the philodendrons. This one is philodendron El Choco Red. Uh, it is an undeclared species as far as I know, possibly a hybrid, who knows. Um, at any rate, this plant, when I got it, had like two tiny leaves. This is one of them, so like the size of my hand. And the newest leaf is the largest and is like quite a bit bigger. So pretty cool, right? Growing a lot. The other philodendron that I have is philodendron melanochrysum. Uh, you can see that this new leaf has got kind of a vibrant neon green center. As the leaves grow out, the um, color of the leaf changes. But typically, you'll expect them to have like a dark green leaf with that center line, and um, they're they're quite stunning, but also very large. Uh, the leaves are getting bigger, pretty much with each new growth. This one still looks small. It should continue to expand over the next week or so uh, until it looks like the previous one, which is bigger. Uh, the next philodendron that I have is philodendron. Sidori or Natum. I got this from Jane of the Jungle. We did a plant swap. And it's a pretty tiny thing. I've been putting it under fairly high light, hoping to stimulate root growth. It looks a little bad. Jane, if you're watching this, don't worry, I'm not gonna kill it. Hey, hope. <laughs> and then the last philodendron I have is philodendron. I believe this is called philodendron Adam. Uh, I got it from Walmart. No, I got it from Home Depot. When it comes to plants that I collect, I, I generally, buy the ones that appeal to me. Sometimes that means that they're rare and expensive, and sometimes that means that I get them from Home Depot because I see it and I'm like, well, that's really cool. Uh, I don't like the idea of being a plant snob, though 
sometimes when something becomes commonly available, it, it loses its luster or appeal. And I, I don't know what that's about, but um, Monstera, the, the Albo Borzigiana, used to be something that I was like, wow, it's amazing, I love it. Then I got that plant and, and the, the Albo started to grow out and I was like, man, this is a pain in the ass, I don't like this plant anymore. So just like a quick caveat on why I buy whatever plants that I buy. I probably should have included this one when I was talking about the Monsteras. This is uh, a Midrium medium, which has also gone by like the common name of Monstera Spider-Man. The cool thing about this vine is that the newer leaves as they're growing out, they get really high contrast, which kind of looks like chlorosis, but it's actually how the leaves uh, are supposed to look. And, and if you look online, there's some pretty cool like high contrast versions of this plant. So I like it. The only thing that I think is frustrating about this plant is that unlike other vining aeroids, it doesn't produce a leaf every node. It actually spends a substantial amount of, of vine-like space just growing length. Uh, so that was something I wasn't quite expecting from this plant. Uh, right now I have it, so it's just kind of hanging from, from the area that I grow it in. It will make it easier for propagation. It doesn't make it quite as nice for keeping an aesthetically clean looking plant. And it kind of does the same thing that this thing is, which is it gets really leggy. And I don't, I don't like leggy plants. I like things to look lush and full. And while you can get lush and full looking plants by kind of doubling them up and cutting them back, um, my general preference is to have a plant that just doesn't have that rambling growth style. Like it's something I really don't like about Hoyas. I love Hoyas as a plant group, but what I hate about them or growing them in my collection is that they send out these octopus tentacles that touch all of my other plants. And then if you get something like mealybugs, mites, thrips, anything like that, it spreads to all your plants because of one plant. So it's, a, it's, like, a, it's like a thing I don't like, but, but not for any real reason other than it's inconvenient. <laughs> Next up, I'll cover the uh, Anthurium. So this is Anthurium forgetii, and this I think is Anthurium forgetii. It actually came as an extra cutting with this one when I bought it, and I don't know what it is. So it, it looks like forgetii, might be a hybrid, maybe it's a green form. Um, both of them are producing new plants. I did have a problem in the winter with all of my velvet leaf Anthuriums, and that's that they drop their leaves, and I think it's because my house gets quite cold. I've got a blog post on the topic like on, on my website. So if you want to learn more about the details of these things, you can always refer to that. Um, where, and I do specifically talk about my thoughts or assumptions about why some of the velvet leaf plants didn't do well in the winter. And it might be due to, to humidity. My humidity is quite low. The only, there's like an incongruency in that logic for me though. And that's because last uh, summer when my humidity was still low, but the light was higher and the temperatures were higher, all of those plants grew fine. So, it, it's hard to say what the real problem is there. I also had an issue with some pH down that I was using. It was a phosphoric acid product and it screwed up a bunch of my orchids and the, and I saw some changes in certain aeroids. You can see most of these leaves look pretty good, but then you get down to here. These are the older leaves when I was using that phosphoric acid and it was causing this type of speckling um, on the philodendron melanochrysum. It actually aborted two leaves and they're just, there was a lot of things going on that made me go like, what's going on with this? And I'm thankful that I caught it and I'm thankful that I noticed these things, but it did do a, a pretty good number on a lot of my orchids, unfortunately. And I think that the, that product caused a spike in phosphorus, which then caused a decrease in calcium and it just led to all these other problems. So I don't know if it was temperature related or if it was related more to um, the, the nutrient solution, Whatever that problem was, uh, all of my velvet leaf anthuriums dropped leaves and the ones that didn't die over the winter are now recovering. So uh, part of growing plants is learning as you go, right? And as a YouTuber and, and content producer, I, try, I don't like putting out information that I haven't validated, which is why I haven't done a video on, on arids, arids yet. Because to buy a plant and then talk about its care that doesn't give a, another person a lot of insight about what you know about that plant versus what you actually have experienced in growing it. So another one of my aeroids, sorry, anthuriums is the anthurium salagrens. I think I'm saying that right. It could also be decipens. These came from both of the big ones and, and the forgetii came from, from Equigenera. And I have heard reports that, that it's decipens, 
but the, the two species are so closely related and come from really like really close collection areas that until you see a flower, you're not gonna know. And the, the main difference between the flowers of salagrans and desipins is that I believe desipins has uh, smelly, like bad smelling flowers and salagrans doesn't. So if you have one of these plants, you can't really assume that it's one or the other until you see a bloom, unless you get verification from the seller that that's where they got it from. Anyways, this plant is huge. Uh, Big frickin' leaf. I'll do a head test so you can see how big it is. The petioles at the base are huge, like it's as thick as my finger almost, um, and they've gotten progressively bigger as each leaf has been produced. This is not easy to do, but an attempt at a head test. So the leaf is gigantic, like so big, and they were supposed to get way bigger. Part of the like appeal for me with aeroids is how big they get. I like that they make like a, a space look like a jungle. Um, the only thing is they, they grow really fast compared to what I thought that they would. So they kind of take up a lot of space, which is both good and bad. All right, and the last anthurium that I have is anthurium rugulosum, I believe is how you say it. So this plant uh, is notorious for not doing well in captivity because it's a cool growing species that comes from cloud forests um, that, that, that just don't do well and typically their leaves shrink. Uh, the person that I got this from though had, had smaller leaves that were burnt and, and reducing in size and the first leaf in my care has increased size by nearly like 3x. So I think that that's a good sign. My biggest worry is that I'm keeping this plant quite wet um, and so I'm a little concerned that root rot will potentially be an issue. However, given what I understand about their care, and, and environment where they grow, that's kind of what they're adapted to and need. So, so I could end up killing it, but I think so far it's, it's a good sign. I also, like in terms of care for this one, I really overclock it with light. It gets the most probably like direct sunlight in the morning out of all of the aeroids and anthuriums that I have. Um, and it also is under LEDs. So, so I think part of having like a cold growing or cool growing species is that you need to actually give it enough energy during the day so that it can sustain itself at night. Especially if your temperatures at night are a little bit warmer um, and the plant continues having like, like metabolizing and using the sugars in the night. Because if it doesn't build those sugars up in the day, then it starts to decline in, in vigor and, and like health over time, is my guess. So it's doing well so far, it's pretty new. It's, I've only had it for about a month and a half. So for me to give specific care on that other than assumptions, not, not a good, strategy, I guess. I also have this Anthurium pseudoceptible. I've had it for a very long time. It's potted with another plant and it's in a huge pot, so it's a pain and I'm not gonna fit it into the um, actual shot with the rest of them. But I've had it for a, a very long time. I, I kind of wonder if maybe it's a hybrid because technically pseudoceptible should be like way bigger. And, and, and I had read that there's, uh, that it's common that this plant uh, is, is either not, not pure or potentially a, a different species. And then last but not least uh, are the kind of the basic aeroids that I have that most people can get at the grocery store or um, garden center. This is Diefenbachia reflector. Uh, cool looking plant. It reminds me a lot of uh, Aglomenia pictus tricolor. The problem that I, I think that I've noticed with this is that uh, it doesn't seem to root very well, and so I, I haven't grown Diefenbachias before. I'm trying to keep it on the drier side, but I'm not seeing active root growth, and that concerns me a little bit. Uh, and then the last one is Epiprimnum aureum. Aureum? I don't know. It's pothos. Uh, a neon pothos that I just love because the color contrast of the leaves on the shelf looks really nice. It's really bold and, and high contrast. And, and they're a, an easy plant to take care of. Uh, again, those like to be on the drier side from what I've seen from the other philodendrons and aeroids. All right, so let's get to the kind of the meat and potatoes of pri why you're probably interested in watching this video. How did I get big leaves like this? Um, being that I'm not a, an aeroid specialist and just a regular guy growing in Canada, our humidity is super low. It's like 40% most days. And when I tell people that, I think a lot of people are shocked because everything you read online says high humidity, high humidity, high humidity. Uh, so, so number one thing, I think that low humidity is slightly important or fluctuating humidity because when the humidity is really high, the plants need to transpire is less. 
And if a plant is transpiring less, then it's pulling less water through the roots. And if you need to fuel and build a gigantic leaf like this, you need ample nutrient flow through the roots. And if you're in a low nutrient area, then to me that says there needs to be lots of water flow through the plant. And for me, that means, yes, low humidity has some challenges, like the potting media can dry out so much that it can kill roots. However, if I can keep the potting media moist between waterings and follow a wet, moist, approaching dryness cycle, and then repeat that every single time and never miss a watering, then there's a consistent flow of nutrients and water through the plants, and that, that makes the humidity issue that I face much more, well, clearly not much of an issue, because it, it just, uh, speaks for itself, right? Like I don't, if, if someone says, aeroids have to have high humidity, philodendron and melanocrystum has to have high humidity, and one guy in the whole world can grow them at a humidity of 30%, then that's not a fact. It's an assumption that's been proven wrong. So there may be reasons beyond specifically just the low humidity. I'm not saying you should grow your plants in low humidity, but I think that airflow around the plant, um, active irrigation, using a potting media that's porous and allows lots, lots of water to flush through and oxygen so that the roots in the pot stay healthy and look good. All of those things are super important um, when growing larger plants like this. If you want, if you want to get into the gritty details of, of what I recommend for care or how I care for my plants, I've written a very long and detailed blog post on it. I'll put it in the description below. Um, I just, for this video, I wanna keep it short, but, but talk about some of the high level things that I think are valuable. Uh, the next thing is fertilizer. So a lot of people use synthetic fertilizer. I use synthetic fertilizer, but I use orchid fertilizer, which is primarily, the nitrogen is primarily nitrate based, not ammonia based. And it has a whole bunch of micronutrients like calcium, magnesium, um, and a bunch of other uh, micronutrients that, that orchids needs and orchids are epiphytes so they grow in similar conditions and to me that's a, an important thing but not very much quarter strength once a week um, I also flush the pots with just regular tap water every second week so I put them under the shower and I like run the shower for probably five minutes I, my goal is to flush at least two full pots of these on a flush day to get all of the old minerals, any like junk that the roots are excreting, pull in new oxygen. You really want that root zone to be ha healthy and happy. So I'm doing like the quarter strength fertilizer every second watering plus a flush in on the days out from that. Um, where my care differs from most other people is that I use an organic fertilizer. So I use uh, blood meal and blood meal, rock dust, baguano, um, and, and, and you can use uh, worm castings and stuff like that. What I, I, don't, I don't know how those things work, I don't know why they work, but I've used them on orchids and on other plants and it is like super food for plants. And I think it probably has to come down to the, ni the nitrogen source. So some plants are better adapted to absorbing nitrogen in the form of ammonia. Other plants are better adapted to absorbing it in the form of uh, nitrate and when you put blood meal into the soil as it breaks down it would transition through both of those points if you know much about aquariums same thing happens in an aquarium um, your material like your organic material it decays into ammonia and then nitrifying bacteria turn that into nitrate and then if you have the right conditions nitrate is removed in an aquarium but for our plants depending on the type of plant maybe it's both or either one of those I don't know, but what I do know is it works really well for my plants. Just if you're going to use um, organic fertilizer, you don't mix it with water. You put it directly into the potting media, especially like when you first repot. And then um, I, I use it two to three times a year beyond the repotting. And what I'll do is I'll water the plants, take a little bit of the organic fertilizer and just dust it on the top after I've watered and then do a quick spritz of water to set it into the soil. And you only need to use about a quarter teaspoon to an eighth of a teaspoon per pot, depending on the size. For this, I'd use about a quarter teaspoon. Um, for that big one at the end, I'd probably use a half a teaspoon. But the objective with the organic fertilizer isn't to shove a whole bunch of junk in your potting media. If you put too much in there, um, then, then you potentially risk making like toxic conditions for the roots because then you have too much ammonia or too much nitrogen in theory, I don't know. 
but I have, I have used it on my orchids and if I use too much, I get root rot. So a little goes a long way and you wanna bracket your applications of that into the potting media a few times per year. Um, another thing I do with fertilizing when, I, when I'm using the uh, MSU orchid fertilizer, I pH adjust that water. My tap water is naturally quite alkaline. This is around 7.5 to 7.9 pH, which means it has a lot of calcium carbonate in the water. Uh, I use citric acid now and a little bit of vinegar, um, and I have a pH meter that I check it. Don't do this without a pH meter, because if you drop the pH too low, you can kill all of your roots. Um, and and it's, I want to caution you on the pH thing, because as much as it's been helpful in, in allowing me to grow better plants that are bigger and more robust, I've also had some really big catastrophes in like testing out different products and things like that. So. If you're gonna get into pH adjustment, be careful, test it on a single plant for like probably a good three to five months so that you know what you're doing and you're used to the process. Because if you screw it up, you can kill a really nice and pricey plant, right? So, so it's what I do, I'm sharing that with you, but I'm also saying like be really careful because I, I would feel really, really bad if you killed a bunch of plants because of advice that I gave you. Um, so, so exercise caution. I'll put some links down below about pH adjustment and, um, and the value of why that's important. Right, so the next thing I want to talk about is light. Uh, I keep hearing in other videos and in things that I read online that aeroids are low light plants. And yes, aeroids do not typically grow in full sunlight exposed like an apple tree would on your front lawn. However, aeroids grow in forests that have leaves and canopies that, have le that, that allow dappled light to come through as well as direct sunlight as the sun is rising in the morning or in the evening. So when we say that aeroids get low light, it means in relationship to full sun. When you go inside your house, most of our walls block 100% of the light and you may have windows that allow for diffused light into your room or your home, but typically that light is still quite dim, depending on the direction the windows phased. East windows and west windows I found allow for deep penetration of light into your home because as the sun rises or sets, the angle of the sun into your home can cast a, a, a light ray or like a, a footprint across the entire like space within your home. Blah, 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 blah. My point with this is, I believe that aeroids need moderately bright light, more, more than dim, more than ambient room light, but not full sun. So my plants grow directly in front of an east window and they get LED light that is a very high output light. You can watch my previous video about the, the lighting fixture that I put up. It puts out about two and a half times more photons than other strip lights. The reason that that's important is the, I feel that my plants are able to grow faster because they're photosynthesizing more, they're pulling more water through the roots, they're pulling more nitrogen, and they have the building blocks to make more leaves, especially large ones, right? And so the Philodendron melanochrysum and the El Choco Red, they get a little bit of, of early morning sunlight, but they're under the um, fluence LEDs for the rest of the day from about noon until five, and they get, they're, they're quite close to it. So from my perspective, Light intensity is super, super important. It's really hard to achieve in a home without using artificial lights or windows. And if, you're, if your plants are in away from the windows, my opinion, opinion is that it might not be enough light to be able to facilitate large leaf growth. That's kind of the short and dirty of it. I also recognize that a lot of these plants are low light plants. You can keep them alive, but they'll create longer leggier growths in an attempt to find more light, because that's what aeroids do, right? Like, uh, let me show you. So this is Monstera adansonii, and if you look, when I had it really close to the LEDs, it created short internodal -like gaps and very large leaves. And then I moved the plant, and what happened is the internodal gaps increased, doubled to triple their size, and the leaf size shrank, as well as the fenestration decrease, because at that point they need more light surface for photosynthesis, I think, maybe. At any rate, my, my general opinion is aeroids need more light than most people think that they need, 
And in some difficult species, like Anthurium regulosum, it may be required for their success in the long term. So just to summarize that, I consider that I overclock my plants. When I get new plants, I put them in, into fairly bright light. It is not hot bright light. Heat causes a plant to need to transpire even more. And if you're growing them very bright and very hot, and then they get dry, they wilt and die, right? Like we've all done that before. If you've forgotten to water a plant when you're supposed to and it's been too warm, then they die. So there's, there's a, a variable of heat versus light. I overclock my plants. It allows them to grow faster, establish quicker, get more roots. And I think that that's super important. It's, a, it's an important po component from, for why I've had success with these plants. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is potting media. Uh, I said that I showered them every second watering and just flush a whole bunch of water through when I'm not fertilizing. Um, so I, I do that watering every single week, once a week on Saturday. Um, the reason that I'm able to water frequently and flush lots of water through the potting media is because I use a really porous potting media. It's about 30% perlite, 30% uh, bark, 30% peat moss, and then about 10% charcoal. Charcoal removes, removes toxicities um, and is important for uh, essentially root health. It, and they use it a lot in orchids as well. Uh, you may notice that on the top of some of my pots I have sphagnum moss. That's uh, a top dressing that I use to help me kind of understand when to water. Like when it's crispy and dry like this, it means it's time to water. Whereas when it's moist and damp and cool, it means that the, the media underneath is still uh, wet and so I don't need to water. Um, it also, when, when I'm acclimating new plants, helps keep the base of the plants where the new leaves are. Uh, a little bit more humid because this sphagnum moss kind of gives off a lot more water because it's really porous and wet and so it keeps uh, a local humidity area beneath the plant. So one of the reasons that that potting media mix is important is because it's kind of custom tailored to my climate. It is dry here. I need a, a moisture retentive potting media that has that's going to hold the water longer. And, and you, uh, my advice for you, not knowing where you're from specifically, like you may not be in Canada, your climate may not be dry. You need to adjust the ratios of your potting media or use a potting media that works for you. Don't, don't take exactly what I'm using and think it's going to be the perfect recipe. Um, if you add more bark, for example, and perlite, you'll increase drainage, which if you're living in a higher humid climate, that's important. If you're in a drier climate like me, you add more peat moss. Uh, if you change the pot type, so if you use plastic, it's going to dry out the potting media slower. If you use terracotta, it's porous on the sides, it's going to increase the drying rate. I cannot use terracotta pots here because it dries the potting media out within 24 hours, like bone dry in 24 hours. I, there, I hate terracotta pots, but I recognize that people who live in Florida or in Central and South America, terra, terracotta is super valuable because it pulls all that extra moisture out and gives that wicking capacity that that they need in that climate. Um, same goes for pot size, bigger pot size, slower dry out rate, smaller pot size, faster dry out rate. And depending on what you put in your potting media, uh, I including the size. So if you're using large bark chunks or small bark chunks or more peat moss or blah, blah, blah. So everything that like, what you put in the pot is kind of, it matters for the root health and you need to find out what works in your climate. One thing that I, I just want to include in this, when, well, these plants all come from the rainforest, right? Like they come from South America, Central America, where it gets dry seasons, rainy seasons, torrential downpour for weeks at a time, sometimes months. It's not like the clouds come through and stick their finger in the pot and go, oh, the media is dry, it's time to water. So for me, it's important to have a really porous potting media that allows me to, to literally flush water through the pots, though it does mean that I have to water more often. I water every single Saturday, sometimes, if the potting media is a little extra moist or damp, then I'll let it go a little bit longer. But even, even then, I still just typically just water it anyways. The concept of overwatering to me is kind of BS. It's based on the potting media you use. And if you're using a really dense potting media like pure peat moss and you've watered and it's been 10 days and it's still moist, you gotta wonder what's going on in that potting media in terms of bacterial growth, in terms of airflow, and in terms of what that means for the roots. So potting media is super important and you need to find what works for you in your climate, your conditions, your pot size, and your watering like cycle and tempo. Uh, for me, I think it's important to use porous media so that you can water lots, 
keep the roots oxygenated and fresh. I do recognize that that means that I have to water every week. Not everybody has time for that. Some people don't want to water that much. Um, and some people want to sprinkle a little bit on top. I don't. I flood the pot. So uh, that pretty much covers my kind of like how, how you do an update on my aeroids since I got them. Uh, I've had them for 10 months now. Most of them, some of them are new. Um, I, I know that it's been a, a while since I did a video uh, with the COVID-19 stuff and I ended up getting sick for a while there. I've just had like a lot of things kind of pulling me away from that. And I, I've been having a hard time finding motivation to film because of the doom and gloom. So stay positive. I hope that your family and friends and colleagues are all safe. I know that the next few months are probably going to be pretty rough for a lot of us. And, um, you know, the plants help bring Zen and calmness to that. So right on. Uh, I will try to film more. It is more difficult now because both Brian and I are stuck in the house and I today I had to lock him in the bedroom so that um, I could film this video. <laughs> um, so other than that, uh, I need to get back to watering because it's Saturday and I have a lot of plants that are thirsty like these guys. Anyways, uh, hope you're good. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. Huge leaf on it. Uh, ow.